Good morning and welcome. My name is Ernie Suggs and welcome to AJC CPS Facebook Live Series. Today, as you can see, I have a great guest today. We have a guest today, uh, the Reverend Jesse Jackson. Uh, the Reverend Jesse Jackson has been in the civil rights movement for, you know, as long, longer than I've been alive. <laughs> Obviously, I went to jail July 17, 1960. July 17, 1960. Which is 57 years ago. Okay, so I wasn't even born then. So he's been in the civil rights movement for a long time. When I was a student at North Carolina Central University, in 1988, he came to campus and he was the first person that I actually voted for for, uh, for president. Um, and, you know, he's just been around, so he's in town. He's going to talk a lot about a lot of things today. So thank you very much for coming, Reverend Jackson. Good, Welcome. Good to see you, Welcome sir. Welcome to Atlanta. And you had to drive way out here in Dunwoody, so you're surprised. I'm, I'm glad to be in Dunwoody. I've never been to Dunwoody before. Well, we have great restaurants <laughs> out here. We have, we have a mall across the street, so if you need a, a, a tie or something, you can go get one. No comment. <laughs> no comment. So uh, we're going to talk about a wide range of subjects today, but I want to first start off by um, your recollection of Linda Brown, the Brown versus Board of Education decision. The Linda Brown is the namesake of that uh, the decision. Three, the three most democratic decisions made in American history, the three most emancipated was one, the Emancipation Proclamation signed by Lincoln uh, January 1st, 1863, uh, which ended slavery for those that he could emancipate at that time. The second was the 13th Amendment, which freed all blacks except those who uh, were in prison, which was a, a step backwards, frankly. Mm -hmm. But the 54th decision, the, mm -hmm. she was the plaintiff in the 54th decision, led by, she was the plaintiff and led by her father and Thurgood Marshall. The most significant decision made in civil rights in 122 years has been the decision, mm -hmm. Topeka versus Kansas, because it laid, the, it shifted the earth legally. Segregation was akin to slavery. Uh, after slavery ended 246 two years, uh, 5,000 blacks were lynched mm -hmm. during the Jim Crow period, yes. 1880 to 1950. All that came on the set, we went from being oppressed uh, and under the slave system to being oppressed and marginalized by the segregation system. That decision made, made segregation illegal. Mm -hmm. I remember asking Mrs. Rosa Parks one day, I said, Mrs. Parks, why didn't you go to the back of the bus, given, given you could have been thrown off the bus, you could have been beaten, you could have been hurt. She said, I thought about going to the back. I thought about it. She said, but I thought by the name of Till and I couldn't go back because mm -hmm. he was, had been killed August 28th. She was arrested December 1st. She said, but then Attorney Fred Greer and I had been practicing and planning to sit in on the bus uh, every Wednesday, she said, to test the 54 decision, see if it were real. Uh, and the big victory was not the bus boycott of 55, that was a significant victory, but it was a local victory. The big decision was the legal decision made in 1956 where the Supreme Court decision was, was affirmed. Okay. Uh, if we had just won the Montgomery boycott, you'd just, you'd just been had desegregation of Montgomery buses. Then you had to go to Birmingham and Atlanta and other places. But the, the 54 Supreme Court decision was validated in 1956 after the sit-in movement, which that, of course, had launched Dr. King mm -hmm. and all his work in subsequent 13 years. But the most fundamental legal decisions were the Emancipation Proclamation, A, uh, B, the 13th Amendment, and C, the 54th Supreme Court decision. And so Linda Brown holds a huge role in our history, and so we look forward to being with her family this weekend. Oh, so you're going to go up? To, you're going to go to church? I expect speaking. to do so. Okay. Now, you're, how long have you been in town in Atlanta? A couple of days, we, Anna, we were, Anna and I were in, Anna Young and I, we were in Memphis this weekend. Okay. Uh, at the I, I Am A Man Banquet. Okay. Uh, and uh, doing recollections there. And then and I did a, um, an interview uh, at the motel this past Sunday. Went up on the hill where the shot came from, for, really for the first time. Okay. It was quite emotional, frankly, because every time I go to Memphis and go to the balcony, it's always like pulling the scab off the sore. Okay. The wound is not healed. Yeah. Fifty years yeah. later, the wound is not healed, and so to do it with Andy, they're going to a different dimension because when we were there fifty years ago. Jose was there. Jose is dead now, and Bevel and Reverend Abernathy and Dr. King. Yeah. So much yeah. of our team uh, has made that transition. But Andy and I th together, it made it a different kind of emotional experience for me, frankly. Mm -hmm. Now I want to get into April Fourth, but I want to. I, know, I asked you why you were in. How long you've been in town? Because I understand that you went at and visited one of our favorite people here in Atlanta, Rita Samuels. Rita Samuels was one of Dr. King's staff members. And, and part of her work, in addition to being with Dr. King's work in, in the South, 
but she also was the key contact with Jimmy Carter's campaign. Mm -hmm. She's the one who leveraged that relationship into hooking Dr. King and the young up with Jimmy Carter, mm -hmm. and Dr. King Sr. with Jimmy Carter, and of course, and it played the great role of the United Nations from that. And Rita is now in a coma, and she deserves our prayer. She's such a wonderful person. She organized women across the state of Georgia. She has been a freedom fighter all of her life, and so we pray especially for her and ask God to have mercy on her. Okay. Rita Samuels. All right, Rita Samuels. Um, and uh, for those of you who are just joining us, I'm Ernie Suggs with AJC Sepia. This is the Reverend Jesse Jackson. If you have any questions, please submit them in the comments section. Uh, we're going to take all of your questions, and uh, we're going to have a really, really great conversation with Reverend Jackson. So you mentioned that you were in Memphis with uh, Andy Young this week. This is the 50th anniversary coming up on it, uh, April 4th, um, 1968, the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. You were there. Uh, you, as you said, you and Andy are two of the surviving members who were there that day. What do you think about when you think about that day? And going back and I think about the focus of, of the trauma of the assassination. We often ignore the drama that led to the assassination. Okay. And that's the season we must understand. Dr. King said we won the public accommodation bill, having won Montgomery and Birmingham, the Voting Rights Act for housing, but too many working poor people. Mm -hmm. Uh, people living in trailer camps, and so on the January 15th, his last birthday, which we didn't know would be his last birthday, he convened in his, the basement of his church about 50 people, some whites from Appalachian, Smoky Mountains, some Jewish allies led by Ella Weinstein, peace activists from New York, a few labor leaders, some blacks from Deep South, Georgia, Alabama, South Carolina, Mississippi, Alabama, uh, some Native Americans, and some Latino allies from out in the in Southwest. And he, and he came to church around 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock that morning, had his windbreaker jacket and his mm -hmm. blue jeans. Folks, how to end poverty. Uh, that the next big step was to lift people. He felt that should be a floor beneath which no one would fall to access to affordable health care, education, and jobs that pay, and a sense, a sense of, of, of judicial, a sense of justice. And so that afternoon around, uh, around noontime, Zona Clayton came in yeah, yeah. and brought the cakes. And I keep forgot it was your own birthday. We, <laughs> had, we, we had ate the cake real fast. Uh -huh. Then the afternoon, uh, at Lawrence led a workshop on how the end of one Vietnam. So he spent his own last birthday, A, with family, B, at church, C, focused on poverty as a weapon of mass destruction. Mm -hmm. Some measured birthday celebration, that how they end the war. He felt that the war in Vietnam. Money was designed to war, poverty was going to war in Vietnam. We should be, we were killing abroad, killed three million Vietnamese, three million Vietnamese were killed in that war. Mm -hmm. About 60,000 Americans were killed, so it, just, it was a killing field. So he wanted to shift the attention from killing in Vietnam to healing at home, and he felt that we should go, go to Washington and engage in civil disobedience, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. top traffic, go to jail, and force the Congress to deal with the tension between war and peace. Mm -hmm. And so around, um, and that was a very tough spring for him because he was on the attack, not so much because of poverty. People dismissed poverty as something that uh, he couldn't handle, per mm -hmm. se. But b there were those who were saying if he we, we came to Washington, there would be riots. Oh, yeah. It was yeah. not the truth. But one of his board members wrote a letter to the, to the New York Times and attacked him. And some ministers locked him out of their pulpits and the editorials were against him. But the real thing is, was not just a poverty issue, but the issue of the war itself. Okay. He was seen as unpatriotic, less loving, less appreciative of America at the time of war. And he realized that the go against the nation at the time of war is a very tough decision. And this was in 19, he made this famous Vietnam speech in 1967, April which 3, was before... April 4th, 1967. Which was before the 70s, of course, when the anti-war fervor was at its peak. So 1967... We were still kind of coming out of Korea, coming out of he, World War II. He, 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 was, he was on the cutting edge of it. Okay. And uh, I should never forget, he called one Friday night before we went to Memphis. And he said, uh, I need a few of you to come to meet me tomorrow morning. I was reluctant to come because we were doing bread basket in Chicago. We had our work going and Beppo was there and Reverend C.T. Vivian was there and all that. And so I said, I, I'll do my best. Reverend Abernathy called and said, you guys come. Martin called. He don't feel like arguing with you. Okay. <laughs> so we, next morning we came by, nine of us were there. Uh -huh. uh, Hosea and Andy and uh, Dorothy Cotton and Reverend Abernathy and Dr. King's father and a few people. Mm -hmm. And um, he said, 
I've been, for the last three years, I've been with Anthony and his wife, Jean. I've been with my wife, Coretta. I've been with Reverend Abbott Anthony and his wife, uh, um, Juanita. Juanita. And said, uh, I thought maybe I should, maybe I should just quit. Mm -hmm. And and they said, Doc, don't talk to me. He said, Andy, don't say peace, peace, for there is no peace. I feel the pressure. Sometimes I feel so all alone. Uh, maybe I should just, I've done maybe as much as I could do in 13 years. Mm -hmm. We, we, we won Montgomery, and we won Birmingham, and we're making an impact in Chicago. And we're now fighting the war to end the war. He said, then uh, maybe I'd become president of Morehouse, mm -hmm. if I'm traveling to write books. And, uh, he said, but if I stopped and went back, the, those who never gave up, Frederick Douglass and, 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 uh, Frederick Douglass and, 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 and they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't understand. Harry Tubman, I couldn't give up. Mm -hmm. He said, well, maybe I should, thought I should, Fast to the point of death. Oh, wow. Um, and then there was that, and I moved out some disarray that Stokely and Rapp and Floyd McKissick and Jim Farmer and, 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 and there is um, uh, Roy Wilkins and, and Whitney Young. So, but at least we're friends. There may be some disagreements about tactics. Mm -hmm. At the point of death, were, but we're friends. Wow. They would come to my bedside and we could regroup. And then we, we said, look at it, and they said, but maybe, you know what? We can go on, go, on the, go, go on to Memphis and stop by and help those garbage workers. Two sanitation workers have been killed. Yes. Uh -huh. He said that, um, and he just started talking about them. He said that they, they, they're worthy as human beings. Uh, they should get paid when they work. They should have the right to collectively bargain. They won't take those uniforms off one day and, and watch their children graduate from school as well. Mm -hmm. He said that uh, th those workers, uh, it's necessary work. If they don't clean up the garbage, the surgeons can't do operations. Mm -hmm. The people can't breathe. Yeah. Uh, Asman, he's uh, talking yeah. about the virtues of the, the sanitation workers. Mm -hmm. The environment. And the, 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 the environment. And I watched him, and it, I took notes of the same three moves Jesus went through. One, let this cup pass from me. Jesus had to look at, think about Calvary. Then he said, as he, as he prayed, disciples slept. And then not my will, but thine be done. He went to the same kind of three moves. Mm -hmm. We left that with him, and he said, and so we said, well, we'll meet you in Memphis. It's cut a long story short. Mm -hmm. Well, let me, before you, um, before you um, go on, but a lot of people um, did not want to go to Memphis. A lot of people who were in his staff, right, did not want to go well, to Memphis. Tension. They saw it as a distraction from the Poor People's March? Well, we were trying to, we were, we were d debating democratically as to what, what's the hook. If we, if, we, if we come to Chicago, you, on education, you can't quite get your arms around it, but then there's the fair housing marches and it happens. Mm -hmm. With the Birmingham, with Reverend Shelsworth, and, and the reaction, it kind of happens. But how do you get the hook around it? Mm -hmm. And it was just a, a debate. Okay. How do you get traction? Okay. And, uh, but Reverend Lawson called, who was Dr. King's friend, Reverend Jim Lawson called. Mm -hmm. And here you had scientists who were working poor people. These were people, you couldn't say they were lazy. They work hard to have been killed. Uh, they, they, they do the nastiest work to help other people remain clean, mm -hmm. as it were, sanitation workers, environmental, yeah. environmental green workers, so, so to speak. Uh, and so we're going to Memphis. Okay. And then we're going to Washington because, because Memphis was the poor people's campaign writ large. Uh -huh. It was concretely working poor people like today. 44% of, of people, of Americans are working poor people, 54% of blacks are working poor people, make less than $15,000 a year. Mm -hmm. Half make less than $12 a year, an hour, an hour. Mm -hmm. And some make less, make less than $9 an hour. And so in some, that's concretely the poverty zone where people cannot make ends meet. There's more month than money. Mm -hmm. And so we went on that basis, and that, uh, that was a big debate about it. As we often debated, mm -hmm. we would go down to say the frog frog more South Carolina figure this year we're going to have open housing. Well, how can you prove that the houses are discriminatory? discriminatory? We finally worked out exper gun, gun experiments mm -hmm. and we worked it out. Uh -huh. So uh, those arguments sometimes have been amplified by people. They was arguing. We argued all the time. Uh, and we, we debated all the time. Uh -huh. And he encouraged it. Uh -huh. He would sit back and watch the base and they get out of hand and Ralph would step in, cool it, guys. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was the, the nature of our, of our relationships. Did you go to, uh, I know he went to Memphis three times. Did you go all three times? Well, twice. Twice. The first and the third time. Yeah, th okay. that, that's, that's after we left that Saturday, I went back to Chicago. Okay. Spoke at Liberty Baptist Church that Sunday and I came to Memphis that Monday. Okay. He was coming at first. He was late because the, um, the plane was emptied because they said the bomb was on the plane. Mm -hmm. 
and they said my mom the king's on the plane and maybe a bomb so they had to empty the plane and all all that and so um he lived under that kind of danger and yeah. threat of death all the time yeah. and his reference to death we thought he had to do more with that with that plane of being emptied and other experiences than anything else uh -huh. we, we didn't think he was looking forward to some james or ray but to that and, and and that day he got in and Hosea and Raf and there's a picture of Hosea and Raf and Dante and I on the balcony. Yeah, yeah. People had gathered. And that was taken April third. No, that has to be around April second. Okay, okay. Because uh, because when we got there, we went on to a ministers meeting to mobilize the ministers, and Dr. King said, "Well, if we can." court their interest. Mm -hmm. Their interest was in economic development. They were very attracted to Operation Breadbasket. Uh -huh. We put some money in, in the black insurance company and in the black bank and tri-state newspaper, the black, defendant of the black newspaper. Yeah. Yeah. And we kind of had that, that zone and seeing at the black motel, the Ram motel, mm -hmm. that was kind of the economic development. But he had a broader picture. He figured that should be a floor beneath which New America would fall. That's where the Appalachian, um, uh, Appalachian white, uh, Smoky Mountain white, uh, Delta blacks and picking cotton yeah. as, as a word that, that can converge. So we went through those dynamics and then he came back and the, the next day uh, we it's interesting conversation he said you know my dad's a teetotaler. What do you mean? Uh -huh. the, dad didn't drink at all you know uh -huh. anything uh -huh. socially otherwise. He said dad came up from uh, I think Cornelius George I think it was the and and his dad saw my granddad uh, out in front of the church and he, he met him, and, and, he, and he met Dad's daughter, my mom. Uh -huh. So his dad's always been very smooth, you know. <laughs> and Dad said, Dad says, we're going to get that church one day. Uh -huh. And we laughed about that. And he kind of walked through his family's background, mm -hmm. and how his father took him downtown to get some shoes, and, and they was insulted. His dad stood up and fought back. His kind of innocence of dignity yes. came from his dad, his sense uh -huh. of grace came from his mom. Uh -huh. he, had, he had that, that combination. Uh -huh. And... Uh, then he said, you know, I don't feel like speaking. I have another headache. I think he may have asked Andrew to go speak. He asked me what I could go speak uh -huh. again tonight. And I was kind of empty. Uh -huh. And Ralph said, Let, just let's wiggle together. It was uh -huh. raining. It's April 3rd. So Andrew stayed back. And Ralph and I went to Mason Temple. And we got near the door, the side door. And the, the church was about half full. People were cheering. Just Ralph suggested they're not cheering for us. They think Martin's behind uh, us. Uh, don't, no, don't confuse yourself. Uh, they're not uh, cheering for you and me. Okay. <laughs> so we that side. will come later for you. Yeah, we went out of the side of the church back where Bishop Mason's tomb is, and we had prayer there. And Reverend Abner called Dr. King on the phone, pay telephone, if you will, uh -huh. and said, Doc, come over just for a few minutes. They, they, they want to see your face. Mm -hmm. They've come out in the rain to see you. So he said, I'll be there in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. So. He came in about 15 minutes, and we went up on the stage, and the pulpit, and the people applauded. Mm -hmm. And that's when he kind of walked, as he walked through his background that day, kind of mm -hmm. walked through history. Mm -hmm. If there were any other time to be alive, it would be a good time yeah. to be alive. That, yeah. that The rhythm of that speech uh -huh. came really out of a conversation that day. And then he said that, uh, as Jesse Jackson said, maybe we should dis redistribute the pain. As I said, if, if the male would not respond to the legitimate quest, Mm -hmm. which look at some major corporations and begin to aim boycott them as well. Mm -hmm. Let them, maybe the man say, this thing is, is costing us too. Mm -hmm. Redistribute the pain, mm -hmm. that, that kind of conversation. And then he shifted gears and said, but I'm not fearing any man. We kind of heard that before. Okay, okay. Uh, we didn't think it was necessarily something in the bushes the okay. next day waiting for us. Was this a great speech in retrospect? Oh, my God, yes. It, it, but when it, you were hearing it that night, did you think this is it? Yeah, what, what struck me about it that night was that I saw ministers crying. Several of the ministers, seven of the ministers and film directors cry. Okay. It was, it was a pathos. There was something in the air about that speech that was just kind of kind of grab people. Mm -hmm. And people kind of, they were kind of still, so to speak. Reverend Ben Hooks was there and Bishop Patterson was there. And um, so... When you got through, he turned and, and we left and went back to the motel that night. The next day, uh, while he and Andy and Ralph and Reverend Billy Cows and I were talking and playing, we met with some of the guys who had, who had broke up the first march. Are these the invaders? Yeah. Okay. And those guys, they, they didn't know what they were doing. Okay. They, they were trying to get Dr. King's attention. Okay. They, they were not terrorists, quote okay. unquote, mm -hmm. doing something silly. And one apologized, look, what we want from you, really, we need some money. Okay. They said, I don't have any money. 
You can go up to New York and get money from the foundations. You, you can get money to help us out. He said, I'll try, but I'm, I'm not, I can't do that. Well, you, you can get to Dr. King. Mm -hmm. So they kept in, said, Jose and I said, Dr. King has told you he can't get you any money. And uh -huh. we'll, we'll work with you. We can't get uh -huh. you any money. Uh -huh. So we kind of went through that. And so uh, Ben Branch and some of the musicians we brought down from Chicago, Ben Branch and Wayne Bennett, who used to play with Bobby Blue Bland. We were over in the carousel practicing music. Mm -hmm. And we were scheduled to go to Billy Kyle's home that night around, around 5.30. And so an hour later, Dr. King is still not coming out the room. So we came across the courtyard, and um, Billy Cobbs was walking down the, 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 walking down the uh, balcony stairs. And I was coming across the courtyard, and Dr. King said, Jesse, you, you're always late. I said, Dr. King, you're late. You're an hour late. Uh -huh. We left. <laughs> he said, we're going to Reverend Kyle's home for dinner. Uh -huh. uh, very, very social acts, very formal. Uh -huh. We're going to his home for dinner. I uh -huh. said, I understand. You don't even have on shirt and tie. So, Doc, what's, what you need to eat is an appetite, not a shirt and tie. That's what I on now. That's the prerequisite. <laughs> you don't eat about it. <laughs> and so, you know, we, we kind of laughed, and uh -huh. he looked and he saw Ben Branch. And he had heard Ben play Pritchard Lord on, on the uh, saxophone, uh -huh. oh, maybe two weeks before in Chicago, the Brett Baskin meeting. We should play my favorite song tonight. And uh, Ben said, I will, or something like that. And then he read it was like, it was so instant, uh -huh. it, it severed. Uh, all I remember is some voice saying, get low, get low, because whoever it was, if it had been a semi-automatic weapon, mm -hmm. they got a bunch of us, uh -huh. you know, and I was going to run towards the steps, and, I, and the panel was doing the same thing. Reverend Collins said, there's a picture of us pointing. Yes. And that picture is, our backs are against the wall, Dr. King's lying here, and the bullet came from that way, not this way. They're coming toward us with drawn guns. Mm -hmm. The police are. Yeah, uh -huh. we said, well, it came from that, that other way. At that mm -hmm. time, there were these high bushes and trees. They cut them down that night, interesting, which is real evidence. They mm -hmm. cut down the bushes and trees on that hill. It's now a park where the uh -huh. restaurant was. Mm -hmm. But there were tall trees, and make one suspect James Orange, he thought he saw smoke coming out, out the bushes. Uh -huh. Others said smoke came out of a window in the hotel looking down that uh -huh. way. We didn't, we, we didn't quite know. Mm -hmm. When Reverend Abernathy came by and said, back up, and my mom, my friend, mom, you, you, you can't leave us, please, don't, don't leave us now, you can't leave us. But I think Dr. King was gone at that point. Mm -hmm. I got up and wiped my hands off, and I was standing next to it at 305, and I called Mrs. King. And she said, I said, how are you doing? She said, I just am lying there reading. I said, Mrs. King, I said, uh, uh, Dr. King been shot, I think, in the shoulder. Mm -hmm. And I think you should come over here. I couldn't really say what I had seen. Okay. There, was, there was too much to say. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess in about seven, eight minutes, the press call said he was dead, you know, and mm -hmm. it, it, the whole world shifted at, at that moment mm -hmm. in time. And I think Memphis deserves a different place in the scheme of things than it has been accorded in the sense that Atlanta's like Bethlehem. This is his birthplace. Okay. Mission Templars like Gardner Gethsemane, we consider what, what his options were. And Lorraine Malkin is like Calvary. Mm -hmm. Not too far from the, from the crucifixion comes the resurrection. Mm -hmm. The new hope, the new possible. He was killed, not in Atlanta, in his bright lights, but for the Appalachian whites and Smoky Mountain whites come to converge, Mississippi River where whites and black cotton pickers meet at that river, river's edge. If ever the whites, uh, chemical workers and coal miners of, of the Appalachia and Smoky Mountains, and the blacks and whites of the Delta Vargas and Mississippi, if that group ever come together, that there is, there is the moment of transformation. I think his dying there had great significance that must be read into, frankly. Mm -hmm. I think there's Bethlehem, there's God in the Seminary, and there's crucifixion, and there's resurrection. And, and he was shot into immortality. You know, the week before he was killed, he was rated about 52% in the negative among blacks, uh, about 72% in the negative among, among whites. Uh, blacks have been convinced that he should not have been talking about the war in Vietnam, he should been talking about the poverty issues, the civil rights issues at home. And, and he felt the sense of the, of the, of the, of the winter, winter resistance, you know. Mm -hmm. But then when he was shot, the resurrection occurred and everybody began to embrace. Uh -huh. And so now today we've lived 50 years in the in the atmosphere of the resurrection and some tremendous things have happened mm. well, I think in 50 uh, be, years. Before we jump to 50, do we have a question? Yes. Okay. 
Do you uh, want me to read this? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so <laughs> what does Reverend Jackson think of the movements like Black, Life, Black Lives Matter and March for Our Lives? Okay, well, yeah, okay. Well, well, Black Lives Matter is an expression of the youth of this age saying how they feel. Okay. And they feel that the yellow shot in New York 41, 41 times mm -hmm. and the police walk free. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the killing Trayvon Martin kill in uh, Florida and the killer walk free. Ferguson Brown kill. Somebody said, oh, Black Lives Matter. It just, it just seems so natural. Mm -hmm. the, 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 we, the, we count. We've been killed in Chicago by police. Uh, uh, we may matter. And so that, that's I mean, it's a logical extension of our struggle, it seems to me. Uh, and I, I, I was looking the other day at, at, a, at some footage of some uh, students at Howard University in 1932. They were marching saying, make legally lynch, lynching illegal. Uh -huh. They were saying Black Lives Matter, don't, okay. don't lynch us. Yeah, yeah. It's just the language, language of, you, 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 could, you couldn't hashtag it during those days. Yeah, yeah. Dr. King never, never saw a cell phone, you uh -huh. know. Yeah, never he, was on Twitter. He, he never saw Twitter, never, never <laughs> saw it. And so that, and those movements have, to, the, 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 what's redemptive about the march, uh, marching this past Saturday, March for Our Lives, March for Our Lives is that We've been arguing the case for some years, 5,000 killed in Chicago the last few years. Mm -hmm. We tried to get a White House conference uh, under President Barack to focus on cause and cures of violence, guns in, drugs in, jobs out. We were trying to get attention. We couldn't quite get it. And when those kids were killed at Parkland, their response was so organized and so disciplined. Uh, you couldn't put any of the stereotypes on, on their killing mm -hmm. and find that the cut runneth over. We thought we thought Sandy Hook went to cover with a run over. Okay. Uh, the killing in Denver, uh, uh, the shooting of Gar uh, Congressman Gifford in 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 uh, in, 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 in uh, Colorado. Ar Colorado? Was it Colorado? Arizona. Arizona. Yeah. Arizona. Uh -huh. But it never quite happened. But in this case, the cup ran over. But and so you had this massive demonstration. A, it was it was massive. Mm -hmm. It was nonviolent. It was multicultural, and it was. Focused. Do you think this is going to make a difference? Because we've had Gifford and. Um, Connecticut and all these places, but is this going to be a difference? I, I think it's different because the four million high school seniors are eligible to register and vote. Okay. Uh, all those who are 17 now who will be 18 by November can register and vote. They go from those children marching to my distinguished constituents marching. Yeah. They have the power. There are more 17 to 21 year olds than there are 71 to 81 year olds. Mm -hmm. So they, 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 they are connecting their marching with the right to vote which is what Dr. King bequeathed to this generation, the right to vote. So you, you look at the massive nature of it, and it's a global march. Mm -hmm. People marching all over the world last Saturday. And I think that they're not going to turn it loose until they're going to begin to judge politicians by those who accept and don't accept NRA money. Mm -hmm. NRA has had a stranglehold on the Congress for too long. It's one thing to have a gun on a, on, on a, on a reservation, a gun in, in a guarded area where you're hunting uh, beasts, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. But to have an AK-47 and AR-15, semi-automatic weapons, uh, have nothing to do but to kill people. Yes. They've shot up schools and churches. They can, they can shoot down airplanes. Mm -hmm. uh, the 350 million guns, 350 million guns, 8,000 are semi-automatic weapons. And so what to do except to protect ourselves? And the youth, without any of the politics of, of NRA money, saying, let's end this. Mm -hmm. it, it, and so Dr. I Dr. King saying nonviolence and non-existence, nonviolence and non-existence. And so it looked like we were kind of moving toward nonviolence as an art form now and not just reacting. Mm. You mentioned, I want to jump back to, um, I want to come back to what King's message would be now, but I want to go back to 1968 for one more second. Um, you always, you, all of you guys always live with a threat of death. Dr. King obviously lived with the threat of death. You got you met threats all the time. I'm sure you got threats all the time during the 80s and 90s when you were heavily in, into politics. But what was that? You got the threats, but what was that day like in terms of it actually happened? You know, and to be you there. Know, you know, Dr. King always said there's no defense against ambush and sabotage. Okay. Don't walk around scared all the time. Walk around. You never swim with a head down a bunch of, bun, bunch of bodyguards. Mm -hmm. We, we kind of rose, we kind of became anesthetized. Mm -hmm. we, didn't, we didn't walk around scared. We thought it was unmanly to look scared, to act scared, mm -hmm. to be afraid. Mm -hmm. Because we'd kind of been convinced by him that you're going to die at some point in time. 
But you, if you die, if you're afraid you die every time you get scared, okay. and people with courage have to affirm their lives. And so he was quite aware of that. And I think after John Kennedy was killed, and after Malcolm was killed, he knew he could possibly kill that way. But he was fearless. One of the things Dr. King had as an attribute, besides his academics, was his courage. Mm -hmm. He was a fearless guy. Okay. I mean, Dr. King finished high school at 15, and Morehouse College at 19, seminary degree at 22, and PhD at 26. Very, very able, very bright, very well read guy. But besides, besides all that, he, he was also courageous. He was unafraid. He'd, he'd march in, in the fire, mm -hmm. you know, without fear. He was not foolish, but he was fearless. And so that day was, it, was, it, was, it seemed like it's kind of ordinary uh, because we, we had breakfast that morning and we talked about his family and we met and we were planning to go to Washington to focus on anti-war and anti-poverty. So we were planning that day. We were going to, we were going to go to Reverend Kyle's home for dinner Mm -hmm. and then go to the rally that night and on, on to Washington. But then the, the assassination stopped all that, mm -hmm. that action. But we determined we would not let one bullet kill the movement. Mm -hmm. It's like you're in, you're in, the, you're in the, the big game, the Super Bowl game, your star player gets hurt. You don't, you don't forfeit the game. Mm -hmm. you, you don't tell other team you got the, you're the winner. You don't, you don't run off the field. You have to, you have to put your star player in the place of resuscitation while well, you keep doing the best yeah, you can against yeah, the odds. Yeah. And so we were determined, to, and so we went from Memphis right on to Resurrection City in Washington, focused on the end the war and the end poverty. That was the agenda at that time. And in a multiracial, multicultural kind of way, when you think about that meeting uh, that January 15th where you had Appalachian whites and Smoky Mountain whites who based their chemical and coal miners. Mm -hmm. Some of the hardest working poorest people in America go two miles down that road and beneath the earth every day. And those who pick the cotton in the Delta of Arkansas and Mississippi and those on reservations. He can he can be in all that group let's together, let's have a collective thrust for job and income for, and health care for every American. Mm -hmm. And you said that you um you guys were determined not to let one bullet stop everything. <clears throat> Less than twenty years after his death, you run for president. Uh, was that something that was imaginable? And 40 years after his death, we elect a black person as president. So is that an example of how you did not let this one bullet stop everything? You know, when he was killed that, that night, many citizens went up in flames. That was one reaction. Mm -hmm. uh, another reaction was, let's organize. And so Mayor Hatcher just been elected mayor and Gary and Carl Stokes in Cleveland. Mm -hmm. We began to meet with Percy Sutton from New York and Dave Dinkins and all of us began to meet on like what next. Mm -hmm. In that season, Mayor Hatchie emerged as a real national leader. We had the big convention in Gary and Dana, okay. 10,000 people. Mm -hmm. What do we do politically? Do we go march now? March and now takes in the form of march to the ballot box. Mm -hmm. And so out of that came the mayor of Los Angeles and Detroit. We kind of kept moving. Uh, and in 72, we found out that we began to learn something about the rules of politics, which we knew nothing about. Mm -hmm. We had the right to vote in 65. Blacks couldn't vote for 85 years with protection. White women couldn't serve on a jury in the South. 18 mm -hmm. years couldn't vote. Mm -hmm. uh, those serving in Vietnam. You couldn't vote on campuses. You couldn't vote bilingually. Uh, and you certainly couldn't get proportionality in, 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 the, in, in, the, in the conventions. So we began to learn the rules of mm -hmm. it. And then we went a step further. Uh, that's, that is to say that we went to the McGovern Convention in 72, and Daly wanted to come in with his, with his kind of basically all-white delegation. Mm -hmm. We defeated him. Okay. We were fighting politically now. We uh -huh. learned how okay. the game is played. Uh -huh. In 83, I remember one morning, uh, I was on the radio program, and someone said, well, Jane Brown is going to have a coronation. She's going to have a, you should challenge her. I said, we can't challenge Jane Brown. Uh -huh. In the sense that Stephen Wonder was coming, and Odetta was coming, and OJs were coming for free, uh -huh. uh, with beer and peanuts and popcorn for free. Uh -huh. It was a Chicago City Fest. Mm -hmm. My mind said, we can't win that fight. But my, my movement spirit said, if it's right, it's the fight, it can't be wrong. I said, I'll get back to you next week. So that wins, we met, we met in Chicago, and we had a kind of coalition. said, well, let's, let's walk out Chicago Fest mm -hmm. collectively. So we're okay. So Jesse, your assignment is to get the entertainers to not cross the picket line, mm -hmm. the, the light assignment, you know? Uh -huh. You guys had contracts. Uh -huh. So I called Steve and said, I will not cross your picket line. Once Steve made that decision, it began to roll. Harold Washington came out one day. 
And we say, Harold, you have to run for mayor. Harold said, I'm not, I'm not running for mayor. I said, because uh, I have a good job in the Congress. And, mm -hmm. I, and that's not, he said, I'll tell you what, if you guys would get 50,000 new voters and put a quarter million dollars on the table, I'll consider it. Okay. You? Totally group okay. that. Uh -huh. And we put 400,000 on the books, mm -hmm. raised a half million dollars. Uh -huh. Uh, and, and so it kind of boxed Harold in, in, into running. And so in the middle of that campaign, we heard that Mondale and Kennedy was coming to Chicago uh -huh. to defeat Harold in the primary. Okay. Uh -huh. We had been the Kennedy supporters. Uh -huh. So I said, Man, Jackson, somebody need to run for president. Man said, somebody need to run. He said, I can't run. I'm putting together my, I had to set aside for my family some reserves. Uh -huh. uh, you should run. I said, no, I, no. I went to see Andy. Mm -hmm. And you should run. And they had all the right credentials. And they had been Dr. King's uh -huh. chief strategist. He had been the Congress and UN. Mm -hmm. And they wouldn't do it. In the meantime, we're doing registration across the South. Somebody said, run, just to run. <laughs> I kind of got caught up in that. Uh -huh. I, I felt if I, if I had not run, people thought that we were playing. But we were not playing. Okay. We, were, we were sincere about uh -huh. it. So out of, out, of, out of the attempt of Kennedy and Mundell to uh, undercut Harold, emerged that campaign. So things kind of logically put in place. The thing about President Barack, and I was saying that that night he won, and I was crying. Uh, what struck me was, we from the balcony in, in Memphis, the balcony of the White House where Barack stands and looks over the Potomac River yeah. for the years of the wilderness. Uh -huh. We learn how to do politics. We learn how to vote. We learn how to fight when we won courts. We never stop fighting so that after 40 years in the wilderness, emerges a guy with all the right credentials to become president. Mm -hmm. It was part of our journey. Mm -hmm. so that, that's why I can't focus for so much on the trauma uh -huh. of the session, but the drama. Because we, in, the, in the resurrection, we never stop fighting. Mm -hmm. and we've been winning. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, we're going to uh, wrap up soon. Uh, I want to ask you one final question, or two, kind of two questions. What are you doing here in Atlanta? What are you working on? And where are we now 50 years after, where are we as a country, as a people, as a as a country, 50 years after Dr. King's death. Well, part of what we're doing in Atlanta is the Rainbow Push. We're looking at 50 public corporations in Atlanta. Okay. Uh, part of the very vast extension, really. Those We're looking at those boards of directors and, and C-suites and how they're using their pension monies where they're investing. We're looking at um, uh, their uh, pension funds, looking at their uh, procurement lists. Mm -hmm financial service, legal services, the whole private sector has basically gotten away without being challenged. Okay. We're, we're challenging the private and we're going to make public the, the list of the 50 top public companies that we're choosing in Atlanta. And, and for example, Coca-Cola now has two members of its board directors are African American. Okay. Coca-Cola for the first time have, have two black bottlers mm -hmm. for the first time. Well, that's how it worked. Mm -hmm. We had 9,000, we had 900 black car dealers uh, 10 years ago after the after the big the big dip, we ended up at 300. Mm -hmm. we, we lost ground, mm -hmm. so we've been struggling in the, in the private sector. And so one part of our work here is that the other part is that there are four million blacks in the South unregistered. Four million blacks in the South unregistered. Five hundred thousand in Georgia, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, two and a half million blacks were registered who didn't vote the last election, for whatever reasons. And, and, and we know we lost the election based upon voter suppression. Even before the Russian thing came in, the, 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 report, the Republicans had targeted blacks in North Carolina and Philadelphia and uh, Milwaukee and, and Michigan. We lost those states. They were target, targeted states. And so we were fighting to overcome the impact of voter suppression and those kind of schemes. But there are also now four million high school seniors. Mm -hmm. Boy, that's, that's a new dimension here because if these kids turn, and I saw them turn their, their, their anguish into voting, that becomes a whole new constituency. So you kind of have the pre-Selma and post-Selma. All this group, now this is post-Selma, which is the majority of Americans. Mm -hmm. So we're working, working on, on, on New South economic focus, New South poverty, because the South is richest saw the poorest people. And it just shouldn't be that way. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we've been winning in the South and not getting credit in the sense that you couldn't have the Atlanta Falcons and the Carolina Panthers that we not brought the curtain, cotton curtain down. Mm -hmm. You couldn't have uh, Toyota in Mississippi 
and, and, and Volkswagen and, and Chattanooga had, had not the cotton curtain come down. You could have had the big game between Alabama and Georgia mm -hmm. uh, in, in Atlanta, Georgia. Mm -hmm. Well, Wallace is saying, never, you can't come mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. And Maddox saying with his axe handle, no, you can't. Mm -hmm. And he, in Atlanta, Georgia, has the big game where you're choosing uniform color, not skin color, learning how black and white can function together. That's those all new style victories. Okay. And we're not going to let anybody, including Trump, turn us around because we're going to, we have in this tug of war of the soul of America, we're going to fall by hope and healing or back by hurt, hate, and fear. We ain't going back. We're going forward. And we want some significant victories this year since people have been somewhat traumatized by Trump's politics. Uh, and in, there was a race in New Jersey where the progressive won, with the black lieutenant governor of New Jersey now. Mm -hmm. The big race in Virginia where uh, the struggle about the, the Confederate flag and Heather High was killed. Mm -hmm. We won that race, a black lieutenant governor in Virginia now. Uh, the big race showdown in Alabama December 12th. You had Roy Moore and, and Trump. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the post-Selma forces won that, that election. And so I'm feeling fairly certain that the sense of voting in margin polls as a weapon of... of um, of choice is going to prevail in 2018. I believe that. Okay. So, last question: The Democrats do not have a um, confirmed candidate for president for 2020. Would you like to announce on the CP that you would um, you're going to be throwing your hat back into the ring? Well, there's some people my age who are running. That <laughs> I, I, I beat Biden before. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that there, there are a body of leaders who have the age, the energy, and the stuff it takes. But our voter registration and the consciousness that comes from ban assault weapons and make life more secure for all of us and fight poverty and fight violence, I think the climate's being sent out of it will emerge someone among others who will probably be the Santa Barra. There are some very able people, and I'm convinced that one or two of them will emerge and we will support them. Okay. But it will not be me. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Reverend Jackson. It's been a pleasure to have you. Thank you, sir. AJCC, but you can check this out on our uh, Facebook page, and it's going to be on our website as well. Have questions? What's going on, man? A, a lot of people saying thank you for all that you've done for the civil rights movement. Keep talking. Keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of quite, a lot of people thank you for your service. Well, thank, thank you for your service. Thanks for coming way out here in the suburbs. Done the wood of Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> and prayers for Rita Samuel, if we're still on. And we thank God for the life and living of, of Linda Brown because her being a, a, a child, yeah, less than 10 years old, her being the plaintiff in, in the most fundamental decision of our lifetime, uh, really of this century, uh, we thank God for her life and living and for her family. We, we pray for Linda Brown's soul. May it rest in peace. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you very much. Peace. Thank you very much uh, for uh, joining us today, and we'll see you later. <laughs>